Welcome everyone to Mobile Rolling. This is another week of our podcast series here on MobileRolling.net and of course on Facebook at Mobile Rolling. And we're here today at the House of Chow restaurant in the city, of course, uh, operational at the moment during this coronavirus crisis. And of course, they'll be opening up for dining very shortly as well when restrictions are eased around the state. So a very big welcome and a big thank you to House of Chow for their consistent support of the program. Now, we're joined today by Gary Ridings. Last week, we were talking to Liz Barbaro about some of the things she does with retired horses and how she takes care of retired horses after they're finished racing. And we're going to be staying around that uh, subject today. And we're going to be talking to Gary about some of the work he does with the thermal imaging technology and some of the things he does to help horses that may be injured and so forth. So we'll be right after this. We've, we'll be right back after this with our interview with Gary. Well, Gary, thank you for joining us. No worries. Thanks, Lucky. So you are own your own business, of course, with right. Horse Hotspot. Yes, that's um, it. But it all started um, back when with your studies um, a, a few decades back. Tell us a little bit more about um, what you studied um, early on. Okay, so it's actually quite a quite a long way back where it started. Um, back when I was a teenager, I got involved in the harness racing industry. Uh, worked for numerous trainers. Um, had some great experiences there, just learning um, learning how to be a horseman, I guess. Yeah. That was the, uh, the, the the start of the trade. Uh, then I became a trainer driver. Um, I extended my uh, knowledge for what I've learned, uh, what I had learned within the industry in South Australia by going to America, yeah. um, which must thank Les Harding for that, that uh, he got the ball rolling there. And when I went to America, I I uh, had the opportunity to work with trainers and vets and um, yeah, I, I picked up a lot of uh, you know, great um, modern uh, techn technological and uh, you know, more, more on, on the training side of things as far as um, yeah, how things had progressed in America um, to then bring them back to Australia and then adopt them into the way I wanted to train and drive horses. But um, I spent a lot of time in the afternoons with the the vet, and uh, I got I got quite fascinated with uh, that side of things. Although I never had any desire to be a vet. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I came back to Australia, um, played around with a few horses, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, but after a number of years training and driving, I decided to give that a break and um, looked at getting into another side of uh, the industry as far as helping horses and um, yeah, not not training, not driving, but something that would be natural and something that uh, yeah, I felt would be would be good for me and the horse. So uh, I got into the uh, acupuncture side of things. So I found a diploma course that I could do, a one year course. Um, I must, uh, I missed a little bit there. There was a, a, a stage there where I went back to America for a second time where I spent three months with an acupuncturist. Yep. Um, and that was very uh, insightful, and um, yeah, it, it it didn't give me the um, the fundamentals of it, but I learnt the basics of acupuncture yep. for horses. And then when I found this diploma course that I could do, that was what opened the doors for me. Yeah. Um, so from there, I completed that course. I then went on to Hong Kong uh, and did some training at Sha Tin with some vets there, which was fantastic training. Um, and uh, that then opened further doors as I saw thermal imaging being used. Yep. I saw shockwave therapy being used, all these other natural forms of diagnosis and treatment. And I wanted to sort of take all of them on board and adopt all of them and create a little business. And that's what sort of happened. So it's been a long sort of process, but here I am now um, doing what I love doing. Talk to us a little bit more about your time in America. What were some of the main differences you found over there compared to Australia um, as far as what you do is concerned? Uh, they were always, I thought, much more advanced in uh, definitely uh, Western medicine. They were much more advanced. But not only that, they were very open to natural options as well. So seeing acupuncture for the first time on horses blew my mind, you know, and, and, and I didn't believe it until... I had acupuncture done myself 
uh, and then seeing uh, shockwave therapy done once again, another natural treatment that uh, certainly has a lot of merit and, and in this day and age, a lot of physiotherapists and chiropractors in the human world are using them as well. So, um, so they were very um, modern and up to date with, uh, with technology, but also very open minded to natural options. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit more about your time as a trainer in those early days um, and some of the stuff you've taken from your time as a trainer and implemented in the work you do today. Okay, yeah, look, the training days, uh, I was never really known to be a trainer of uh, great success because of the fact I, I looked for everybody's problems, like everybody else's horses that they didn't want. I would buy the cheapest, nastiest horses going around at the time and I would try and do my natural treatments and, and do things my way and my American influence and, uh, uh, and, and see if I could get a result that way. And I, I think I did all right with, with uh, horses that were out of form and yeah. tried to get some form back with them. Um, so certainly adopting a lot of that American influence and uh, partly, you know, the, the natural side of things certainly helped. Um, and yeah, it, I, I went through the training ranks for, for quite a number of years and um, uh, yeah, it, it's a tough game as we know. It's, um, you know, you really got to love it. I did love it. But uh, when I found this other option to go down a different path, but still be within the industry and still help the horses, I felt that this was, this was what I was looking for in life. So. Yeah. so we'll talk about when you get a client and they have a horse that may be having some issues. Um, what's the first thing you do to approach that situation? Okay, so um, a lot of my clients, a lot of regular clients that use me on a regular basis, um, they would also be using a vet in conjunction with what I do. So um, sometimes they'll call me before the vet, sometimes they'll call the vet first and maybe use me as a second opinion or it's, it's, a, it's a little bit Depends, of... Yeah. yeah, exactly. All different horses have different problems and some... Some are not um, going down the vet path. Some are more soft tissue injury like uh, necks and backs and, and uh, you know, where you need possibly acupuncture, shockwave therapy are, are, are options for that. But, um, yeah, I think it's uh, one, one of those things where trainers will call me where they're, they're not quite sure what the problem is. Yeah. And so the thermal imaging side of things certainly uh, gives us an insight into potentially where there's, where there's smoke, there's fire. And uh, so through the thermal imaging, it, it, it's a great aid in uh, pointing us in the right direction and then making the decision as to what to do next. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Now, as far as equipment is concerned, what sort of equipment do you use when you do these procedures? Okay, so I use a, uh, it's called a FLIR thermal imaging camera. It's an infrared camera. Um, uh, Look, they, they've been around for about 20 years. Um, in the early days, they didn't have a great deal of merit because it's a bit like, imagine looking at an old TV from 20 years ago. Yep. It wouldn't be very clear. The, they don't have very good pixelation resolution and uh, yeah, they've, they've really progressed. And so here we are in 2020 and as you know, television and anything to do in that, in that field has got better and better. So the clarity, uh, really helps with identify uh, what we're looking for. So if I'm looking at a horse and I'm trying to identify exactly where there's some heat in the body when we're looking at knees and fetlocks and uh, upper body, saddle soreness and things like that, uh, it, it certainly can point us in the right direction. And, but, but there's plenty of times I look at horses and um, I don't find anything. I don't find anything above average. So yeah. then I'd recommend the trainer to you know go down a different path. But yeah. um, uh, yeah, so, so thermal imaging has been around for a long time, but it's certainly uh, gaining a lot more um, merit and particularly now, as you've been hearing through uh, with COVID-19, yep. it's uh, a lot of businesses are now looking to buy a camera themselves or set up so that they can have people scan before they walk in the door. Yep. So yeah, certainly have a lot of merit. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, some of the uh, other areas or like industries that thermal imaging is coming into? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, like I said, it's been around for a long time. Um, it's commonly used by electricians. Electricians are looking for hot wires in walls. Mm -hmm. uh, termite inspectors are getting up in the attics and looking for termites. Yep. Um, uh, 
uh, firefighters are using them um, from helicopters looking for uh, bushfire outbreaks in the distance. Um, they just recently I've been, you can actually Google this, um, they've been using it in early detection of breast cancer. Yep. Uh, so, and as, as I just said, the COVID-19 situation, they've actually been around, I've seen in the Hong Kong airport for many, many years now, you walk through the airport and there's actually a big screen, uh, uh, thermal imaging image of yourself as you're walking through, getting off the plane and everyone is being monitored. And, uh, so it's been around for a long time and, and like I say, it is certainly, it's, it's gathering more and more momentum and, and, uh, merit. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more, like for someone like like me who loves racing but doesn't actually know a lot about the horse itself yes um talk to us a little bit more about some of the treat like the natural treatments you were mentioning yep. earlier like shock wave treatment and yes stuff sure like that. tell us yep. a little bit more about that okay sure uh look um the shock waves are quite new i guess um it's been around for a, it's been around for a while but um in australia it's probably been around for i don't know five six years in the horse industry um it, it, look, there's different treatments for different problems. Um, I find some issues in horses respond better to different treatments. So yep. I still believe acupuncture is a, a, a really, really good treatment. Um, you know, it's when I studied it, um, and as I say, I, I did the training in America, which was more just a, uh, like a physical observation of acupuncture being done and writing things down. Yeah. But um, when you actually understand it a little bit more, and if you've ever had it yourself, it, it's mind blowing how powerful it can be. And and it really changed my life many years ago when I had chronic back pain and I was taking a lot of painkillers and so on. And I tried acupuncture and it, it seemed to work better than the painkiller. So so with the horses, it's you know you got to assess the problem first, and then from experience, uh, I would then apply the right treatment for that particular problem. Yeah. So. Um, Generally, acupuncture would be done more on upper body problems mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, soft tissue issues, necks, backs, shoulders. Um, the shockwave therapy can be done from the top to the bottom and actually quite often it's done on uh, lower limb uh, injuries such as tendon and suspensor injuries. Yeah. With your job, I imagine <coughs> it would be one of those jobs when you're, where you're always learning something and you're always learning more things about sure. what you do. Um, tell us some of the things you've come across over the years where with horses that have been unique and something that's caught you off guard. Uh, look, every every case you go to, you, you always keep an open mind. Um, you never know what to expect. Yeah. You never go in with a, a you know any sort of foregone ideas. Exactly. Yeah. You, you know, you take every case, no matter whether the horse is worth a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand um, dollars. They're all different and. Um, but, you know, I've come across cases where there was a case in Victoria a couple of years ago where I was asked to look at a horse that was nominated for the Inter Dominion at the time. And the, the, the trainer had said to me, look, we're scratching our heads. We've had three different vets tell us three different things. Um, I just want another opinion. And so I come along with my camera. This was the first horse I'd done for this trainer. And I pinpointed an area on the horse, which appeared to be the paston, was really lighting up and it was uh, showing an above average amount of heat. And I said to the trainer, you know, this is, certainly appears to be the, the problem area. And he wanted to argue and say, no, no, we've already ruled that out. A vet's already x-rayed that, um, which is fair enough, you know. Um, but if you want my technology and you want my opinion, I can only just give you what I find. There's no... Uh, the, 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 I can only give you the facts. Yeah. And so um, that trainer two days later then rang me back and said, you won't believe it, we got a fourth vet to look at this and they re-x-rayed that area and they found a hairline fracture. And that was to me, you know, a, a, a real sense of achievement because, you know, the, it, it's taken a long time to get um, the confidence in the consumer and in even vets uh, to, to be on board with what I do, but to to sort of turn people's heads and say, hey, this, this technology does work. Yeah. Even the vet that probably originally x-rayed it and didn't find the problem, um, yeah, it, it, the, the problem was there. It, yeah. You know, as I say, where there's smoke, there's fire. The camera doesn't lie, doesn't, doesn't change its mind, doesn't have good days and bad days. It is what it is. And if it's lighting up and it's on fire, I would be, uh, I would be certainly Looking investigating into yeah. Yeah, further into it. 
tell us a little bit more about what it's like when you're trying to promote yourself um because I, I know still a little bit of doubt in the yep. general public and yes. people with horses about this technology mm. what it's like what is it like to try and overcome that and convince people that um this is legitimate yep. and um this does actually help yeah, look, cases like that one I just said um, yeah. certainly helped um, get the ball rolling because that trainer told a bunch of trainers in Victoria yep. and my client base in Victoria grew rapidly. Yep. Um, but uh, look, it, it has been hard work um, with the older generation. They don't like change. Yep. Um, and technology is not something that they, they're welcoming. But uh, I guess a lot of um, my work comes from word of mouth. Yeah. and people recommending me that have liked what I do. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I do a little bit of advertising through Facebook um, and occasionally I might uh, do a little bit of a sponsorship somewhere yeah. where, where my business name gets put out there. But, um, yeah, it is probably more a word-of-mouth situation. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that, and that's probably your best organic growth that you can, you can have. If people like what you do, they'll tell others. Yeah. That's not just standing breads as well, is it? You work on the thoroughbreds and right. down the gallops. Yep, and, of yep. course, it's any horse. Really. Any horse, mate. Um, look, um, yep, standard breads, thoroughbreds, all different breeds of horses for all different purposes. There's, uh, you know, th th there's people out there in the pleasure horse world that have um, quite often a, a common occurrence, saddle, saddle issues, and they could, you know, they could try different saddles and they can try chiropractors and they can... But the one thing for sure is if you use thermal imaging, it's going to uh, it's going to identify whether you do have a saddle problem or you don't. And so that's just an, you know, another avenue in the horse industry, let alone lameness issues of the lower limbs. So, um, yeah, all, all different horses, all different cases. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it, it is something that um, um, it can be used, it can be applied to even, even dogs and cats, you know. Yeah. So... Um, Certainly, uh, yeah, there's no limit, really. Yeah. Well, Gary, <coughs> thank you very much for joining us. No it's been a big ed education today, especially for me. I'm, yeah. I've, um, I've never really looked into this stuff mm -hmm. before, so um, it's really uh, um, come across interesting to me. So um, hopefully um, you've enjoyed your time on the show today. And, yep. uh, of course, if you want to contact Gary, you can. All of his details are on screen at the moment with his business at Horse Hotspot. Thank you for joining us today on Mobile Rolling and we'll be back next week with another podcast. And then again, a big thank you to House of Chow for providing a venue for today's filming and we'll catch you next week.